Our first item of business is the uh, public hearing for the notice of intent filed by the, the town of Waitley for improvements to Haydenville Road. Um, and so at this point, uh, I'll just mention that we did our site visit on Monday of this week. So that would have been 16th, September 16th. And uh, I'm happy at this point to yield the floor to uh, Todd or Kimberly, who wants to be a co-host co so that you can share screen. I'll be the co-host to share screen. All right. It looks like I have that ability. Let me see if I can. Yeah, you should have the authority to, to do that now. Okay. Is everyone seeing the screen? Yes. Great, yep. great. Well, thank you everyone for um, letting us come talk to you tonight. This is the rehabilitation of Haydenville Road. Um, in the town of Whateley, it is a project that is sponsored by the town as well as DOT. Um, and this is our project location map. I'm sure you are very familiar with it. But it is a 1.5 mile stretch of road. It begins at the Williamsburg town line and it ends just before the bridge, um, just immediately before the intersection of Conway Road. And in terms of the need and the scope of work, this has been looked at for um, a couple of years now. Um, there's really a need to improve the pavement surface, uh, and as well as at the same time, look at the roadway drainage, um, potentials for bike accommodations, and then guardrail, pavement marking, signage and water quality. When we really look at these repaving projects, we wanna make sure to take a look at all of those items at the same time, just to make sure that any improvements that could be made at that time are, are done so. Um, and obviously the need for the project is to reduce annual maintenance efforts and continue to have a paved surface that's good for the traveling community. Um, so the rehabilitation at this point um, includes pavement reconstruction and then widening so that there's a 28 foot paved roadway, which is um, 10 foot travel lanes and four foot shoulders on each way. So that's gonna provide an improved pavement surface, improved drainage, it will provide some room for pedestrian and bicycle accommodation that isn't there currently. And then there'll also be roadside obstruction removals. And then adjustments to the drainage and structures, which is one of the reasons why we're all discussing this tonight in terms of the stream crossings and the surface drainages. So we submitted an NOI application to the town. I believe you guys have all reviewed it and we um, have a set up on Monday. These are the impacts that were listed in there. and. Um, I have the ability to zoom in a little bit here. What's important is that since the submittal of the application and our discussion, um, we have been evaluating some of these impacts. And if you'll note, um, the ones that were identified for stormwater outfall pads, we have been able to either reduce or remove those. And I'll talk about that later in the presentation. So a lot of these BVW impacts have been either reduced or removed. We do have some culvert replacement impacts that we'll continue to talk about. And then we have some slope grading, um, places where there's, it's necessary to do some slope grading in terms of the continuation of the project. So the total impacts that were in the application were 1,310 square feet of BBW impacts. Those have been reduced and we're continuing to evaluate those and reduce those um, before we resubmit information to you. Right my desk. There we go. Kimberly, your your audio is a little spotty. I don't know if there's anything you can do, but just thought I'd let you know. Okay. Okay. Um, Todd, do you want to take over then so that you can speak to these? Sure. Okay. Can Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so sure. And and continuing on. Uh, with the des description of the application and then where we're going moving forward. So we had two stream crossings identified within the application and uh, based on discussions leading up to the meeting, there was some additional information sought and requested. So what we've gone, uh, what we put into this uh, presentation slide is some of the information that we have and I'll, and I'll review it and please stop me if you have any questions. So um, 
the first crossing we talked about uh, as you're heading northerly along Haydenville Road is around station 40 plus 87. That's the location of the twin corrugated metal pipes, uh, 24 inch diameters, uh, loss of section. We've discussed these in the field. Uh, we did have the some the bank full width numbers to share. Uh, as everyone knows, the current replacement is, is really essentially matching in kind. Uh, but since our discussions, we are going to take a look at evaluating the different pipe materials and the, and the elliptical solutions. Uh, we've been looking for different geometries that would maybe provide <laughs> some improvement without impacting the water line. Uh, one bit, bit of information that I didn't have out in the field, but I have now is uh, we believe the water line is located about five to six feet below the exist, existing finished grade. So that puts the clearance between the bottom of these 24 inch pipes to somewhere between six to 18 inches of clearance between the two. Um, so that's certainly a challenge to consider um, with regarding to the hydraulic performance. Um, the the two 24 inch pipes uh, accommodate a Q25 storm event with a nine inch freeboard within the pipes. Kimberly, you want to shift to the next one? Sure. So in, in weighing some of the, uh, I guess, the, the, the pure stream crossing compliance structure with the current design, this is sort of a summation. Um, this isn't, uh, so with regards to materials and span, I um, believe we've been over that. The, the, the sample stream crossing compliance structure would be uh, an eight foot clear span with a three foot rise and one foot of embedment. Again, that's getting, uh, we believe we could squeeze that in, but it's getting really close to that, that water pipe. And just so uh, in addition to, or as a, a quick aside here is, uh, we did also receive that note from the city of Northampton about dig safe. And we have included test pits at every pipe crossing on the project within the plan set. So we are intending to, in addition to do some dig safe out there during construction, we're also including uh, items in the contract so that the contractor can, can get his eyes on the water main at every crossing. Um, <clears throat> And one additional piece, uh, piece of information that we didn't share is the estimated costs. So the fully compliant stream crossing structure is estimated to be $235,000 for the box culvert. And the current twin 24s are 25,000. So um, before I leave this slide, I'd just like to say there could be something in the middle that we talked about in the field. Um, next, next slide, Kimberly. This was the larger culvert uh, towards the end of the project uh, with the sap lines running through it. This is at station 84 plus 40. The existing corrugated metal pipe is a 48 inch diameter. It's deteriorated. We saw it out there. Um, the estimated bank full width for that structure is 16 foot 10 inches. Um, in a similar line of discussion, we talked about the, the alternative of coming up with something um, that would hold material uh, in the pipe and potentially be depressed deeper into the stream. And I'd say that we're gonna look at evaluating a similar type of squash pipes or ELOC type corrugated metal pipe structures. Um, but with regards to hydraulics, there's plenty of hydraulic room or capacity. Um, the existing, uh, the replacement increases the hydraulic area by 42%. And the replacement accommodates the design flood or Q25 with uh, six inches of freeboard below the pipe crown. So similar in, in keeping, uh, jumping right to the costs. Um, uh, the 60 inch pipe was estimated at 42,000. And again, the, the 18 foot clear span by five foot rise, you know, fully stream compliant crossing structure would be up and is estimated at 246,000 at this point in time. 
So again, there, there may be something in the middle. Uh, another aspect of the project that we we spoke about uh, and like to comment on tonight is all of the stormwater outfalls that uh, Kimberly had mentioned uh, that introduce or introduced uh, BVW impacts. I have taken a hard look at those since the field meeting. Um, pretty confident in saying that right now, uh, five out of six can be eliminated. I'm still looking at the six to see if I can eliminate um, any BVW impacts. And uh, in keeping in line with uh, the request I received to utilize existing pipes and where we have existing pipes to try to pull them back away from the wetland. So. <clears throat> And then um, mitigation replication for BBW. Kimberly, do you want me to continue on with this or do you want to? I would just say that, um, it, that we, when we looked at this in the field, we um, noted that the site has some challenges. It's not as flat as it seems to appear in photos. And um, we are going to do some additional work to collect and confirm the contours and the hydrology out there. Um, Scott, to your point, you know, it's, we have to confirm the hydrology that's going to make that, that replication area work. We have also discussed uh, the potential to increase the pipe size to a more stream compliant crossing in, in, in that trade off as opposed to trying to do a replication area that, you know, questionably has challenges um, and possibly use a, a stream crossing instead of self mitigating, um, recognizing that we do need approval for DEP for that. Um, Scott, I don't know if you've had a chance to reach out to DEP since Monday. Yeah, I, I had a conversation this afternoon with Mike McHugh, who's the section chief down in Springfield, and we discussed the situation. We discussed the idea of, of maybe shifting resources away from BVW replication and, and to providing a more compliant crossing structure. He said that uh, he would certainly consider that he's not opposed to it. He said he, he couldn't give his approval over the phone, you know, without more information, but that it was at least an option that he would uh, consider. However, he said that the, the water quality cert will be the key issue. And uh, that you know, go, may go through a whole different DEP office that deals with DOT projects. And so, um, uh basically i'm um i'm planning to contact the person in that office uh, heidi davis um and just run the idea by her and see whether it's a non-starter or whether it's something that might be uh worth pursuing so um, i haven't yet reached out to her uh, after having talked with mike i wanted to check back in with you tonight because if it's something that you don't want to pursue, I won't bother Heidi with it. But if it's something you'd like me to check on, I can, I can reach out to her and and meet with her as well. I think it's great to have that option vetted and see if that is something that we could explore. Um, in terms of you know trade offs, there's obviously a cost to developing a replication area and monitoring it and making sure that it's sustainable. So, and as Todd said, we've looked at the potential for the elliptical pipes to be somewhere in between the costs of what we proposed versus some of the larger, you know, potentials, which would include guardrail and, and, you know, all those additional cost footings and abutments. Um, so we do feel like that's, that's a good trade-off for, um, for the town as well as just ecologically. Um, it's my understanding that water quality cert is, you know, is based on an erosion and uh, water quality, obviously water quality search. So uh, I think there's room in those rules for us to be able to get around the replication for the BBW. So I think that's a possibility too. So um, hopefully that would be what would hang us up, but we, we could definitely continue to explore. Yeah, what Mike said is, is that uh, a condition of the water quality cert will be one-to-one -one replacement of BBW. And, uh, he basically, we, we talked a bit about, uh, you know, basically 401 uh, requirements, you know, Section 401 of the Clean Water Act and Army Corps. And, you know, it says one-to-one -one replacement of, of, he's saying, does it mean wetlands? Does it mean waters of the U.S.? We talked about the idea that streambed could potentially be considered waters of the U.S. and that 
an increase in the amount of stream bed might be uh, a good offset to the loss of BBW. He, he said that was a very clever argument. Uh, he said he wasn't sure whether it, you know, the language of the water quality um, regulations, basically he was open to the idea, but it wasn't a slam dunk. And so uh, that's that's the, the part that Mike raised as the potential concern about the water quality cert. Um, and, you know, I can talk to Heidi and I've known Heidi for many, many years. So we'll, we'll just have a straightforward conversation about it and uh, see whether she thinks that this is an idea that could fly. Okay, good. That, that, that would be really helpful. Uh, I definitely think we could, we, there are ways around it. As I mentioned, we do this in New Hampshire quite a bit. So maybe there's a possibility to sort of trade the correct language around in order to make sure the water quality, as you said, it pertains to the 401 and the Clean Water Act. I, I think there are ways we could language our way through that in terms of as you said, you know, not not having one one replication that's exactly a wetland per se. Um, so that's that's great. That would be really good. Do you need us to provide you anything additional with that in terms of having those conversations, or do you want us to be a part of that? Well, I think the thing that would be helpful for me is if you reduce the amount of BBW impacts further, to let me know what the new number is. So you know what I've been using is is uh, you know thirteen ten. Um, if it ends up less than that, it makes the argument a little easier to sell because when you start talking about you know nine hundred square feet or six hundred square feet, it starts to look like a lot of trouble for very little gain, and it might help make the case that investing that in a good stream crossing would be a better ecological outcome for for the project. Scott, so if um, removing the stormwater outfall impacts is is a reduction of 401 feet, I believe, of BBW. So we're at 909 at that point? Yes. Okay. All right, that's helpful. I, I will send an email to her tomorrow and see if I, uh, she'd be willing to meet with me via Teams or Zoom, and 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 we'll have have that conversation as as soon as it can be arranged, and then I'll I'll let you know what the outcome is as well as rest of the commission. Okay, good, thank you. Um, you you referenced uh, Todd the the letter from Northampton about uh, dig safe. I think their specific request was uh, that. The applicant include in the bid documents a requirement to submit notification to the city DPW upon submission of dig dig safe tickets by the contractor. Is that something that you're willing to to accept? Oh yeah, yeah. I'll just add con. I'll add language into the contract wherever it's appropriate, in in the front end documents for the project, just to coordinate with the city. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I believe they said that they were not listed as a as a as a municipal water service. They were not listed in the in the Dig Safe database. So, right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, that's helpful. Um, do you have more of your presentation? Uh, no, I believe the. the yeah. last... <laughs> okay. Um, let me just pause for a moment and ask uh, any of the conservation commissioners whether they have any questions at this stage in the, the the conversation no questions for me i'm just a little unclear on the um, process what happens next uh well at this point uh you know i have made uh i guess i should probably read into the minute to read into the recording the the comments that i shared with uh, with Todd and Kimberly about the project. It sounds like they're responding to those comments by suggesting that there will be additional information collected on you know, the replication area, if that were to go forward, uh, new, exploring options around the crossings. So it probably would mean a continuation of the hearing until our next meeting and then receiving you know, the new information that you have for us now, plus any new information that you generate between now and then we would review that and and 
continue our deliberations and our consideration of the of the project. Thank you. So let me let me uh, sort of read into the recording and to the record the um, the comments that I provided. Um, uh, the first paragraph is all about setting up the site visit. Uh, second paragraph was about the letter from the city of Northampton, which we've already discussed. Uh, the third is about comments that DEP included on their file number letter, which we can go over, you know, comment by comment after I after I conclude with my comments. And so these are the comments that I had on the notice of intent. I've done a preliminary review of the NOI and offer the following comments. These comments are my own and do not necessarily represent opinions or decisions of the commission as a whole. First, I would like to see detailed assessments, hydrology, soil, and vegetation of BBW to be lost and detailed plans for the wetland replacement area. Information should be presented sufficient to assure the commission that the replacement area will have the appropriate hydrology to create a wetland of the size required. DEP's Massachusetts Inland Wetlands Replacement Guidelines, second edition, September 2022, should be your guide in preparing appropriate supporting materials for the wetland replacement. Number two, I would like to see detailed plans for each culvert replacement on a stream as defined under the Wetlands Protection Act regulations, including long profile of the stream, documentation of the channel bed adjustment potential, stream bed analysis, and locations where bankful measurements were taken. Because the proposed culvert replacements will not meet the stream crossing standards, I would like to see additional information to demonstrate that your proposed designs will meet the standards to the maximum extent practicable. Here are the key elements that I expect to use in evaluating whether you have met the MEP standards. A, at a minimum, each crossing should be designed to pass the 10-year flood event. This is considered a baseline design against which MEP costs will be evaluated. It may be that that should have been the 25-year event uh, for this, uh, the functional class of this road. But anyway, you've already achieved that. It would be uh, B, if it would be physically impossible to meet the stream crossing standards, that should be documented in the supporting materials. In most cases, physical impediments are not impossible to overcome, but might be very expensive to overcome. C, for the proposed culvert replacements, it is expected that costs up to 15% above baseline costs would be considered practicable. Note that baseline costs are not the cost of replacement in kind, but what would be necessary to pass a 10 year flood event. Uh, and then I just said, I may have other comments once I've had a chance to conduct a more thorough review of the NOI and supporting materials. Feel free to follow up with me if you have any questions. So I think to some extent you've already addressed some of my comments and some of them are pending additional information, you know, whether the replication will actually go forward, you know, what is possible for structures that could be used at the stream crossings. So um, if you'd like to respond to any of those comments at this time, feel free. No, I don't think we have additional comments. I feel like we've discussed quite a bit of this. Okay. Um, shall we move on to Mark Stinson's comments on the file uh, letter from DEP? Sure. Now, if you'd like, you can go through this, you know, comment by comment, or I can read the comments and you can respond however you would like to proceed. Um, if you read the comment, I guess we can respond. Okay. Uh, first comment, the narrative on the bankful width for the station 40 plus 87 culvert replacement makes it appear that the width was only observed in the area of the crossing, no upstream or downstream measurements. Were elliptical shape culverts considered? They were not considered. We are looking at that option currently, uh, and we will be gathering more stream information to uh, fully address the upstream and downstream in regard to the bank width. Okay. 
Yeah, it's important to try to get outside the area of influence of the crossing structure itself, because you can end up with scour or you can end up with depositional areas related to the culvert. So I think that's what caught Mark's attention uh, and it's part of the basis of that comment. Second comment, as noted in the NOI, a discharge of dredge or fill material is proposed in a, an outstanding resource water. Therefore, a 401 uh, certificate is required, which you've acknowledged. acknowledged. Yeah. Three, please note the inland replication guidelines were updated in 2022. That, that was in my comments as well. Four, were any actual soil, soil borings conducted to confirm depth to seasonal high groundwater or HSG characteristics, HSG? Um, they were not, not in the BBW, in the replication area. We will be doing so. Can you tell me what HSG is? Is that the hydrology high surface in groundwater? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know. All right, uh, number five, the commission should discuss stormwater standard nine requirements with the town highway department. And you, can you know off the top of your head what stormwater standard nine is? Operations and maintenance. Right. Okay. So it's what you, you've submitted an operation and maintenance plan, correct? Correct. So it's just a matter of making sure the town is aware that that plan is is a requirement in that it has been included in the NOI. Okay. Um, six, where an existing stormwater outfall is located in or near BBW, such as on sheet eight, and is being upgraded or repaired, it should be pulled back and a setback provided. And at this point, you're saying that most, if not all, of those outfalls could potentially be eliminated, correct? Uh, not eliminated. We'd be able to provide a setback. Provide a setback. So okay. for the, yeah, for the, there is no way to eliminate these outfalls um, yeah. on the project. So it's the impacts associated with the outfalls that you're eliminating? Correct. Okay. Thank you. I was wondering how you were going to do that without outfalls. It was going to be one of my <laughs> questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can't do that. Where, um, comment number seven, for sheet nine, where 78 square feet of BVW is proposed to have permanent impacts, is the outfall currently, currently in BVW? If these are new impacts, that is not permitted. Uh, 310 CMR 10.056K prohibits the placement of a stormwater outfall in BBW or bank. Uh, I may, maybe I don't need to continue to read the quote if it's not in BBW or will not be in BBW when you're done. Uh, yeah, the my interpretation of this comment is that um, any new stormwater outfall that requires BVW impact needs to meet the full letter of the law for all treatment and, and the such. And uh, after, after looking at this project up and down, that's simply not possible. So the solution is gonna be to only utilize existing outfalls. Mm -hmm. Okay. Comment number eight, please remove street sweeping from the TSS removal worksheet. In order to receive a 10% credit, Volume 2, Chapter 1, Table SS1 of the Stormwater Handbook shows a regular sweeper would have to sweep the roadway every week, or a vacuum sweeper would have to do it every month. This reviewer is unaware of MassDOT or any community that does sweeping that frequently. Understood. Well removed. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, basically, the next one has to do with the fee. Since the town is the applicant, the project is free exempt. A refund will be processed. Uh, comment number 10, the commission might require the completion of the attached worksheet to assist in understanding compliance with 310 CMR 10.538. Um, I looked at that. I don't think it's necessary for us to use that worksheet because we're working with a a draft guidance document that would basically supersede that we worksheet anyway. 
Additional requirements must obtain a 401 water quality cert for the project before the activities described can commence. Uh, 401 uh, talks about the details of how it must be submitted. And that's it for substantive comments related to your notice of intent. You have any other responses you'd like to give? I have no. not. Okay. Um, commission members, any questions at this point? No. No, no question. Not, not for me. No. Okay. Um, so I have a few questions that I have written down based on my review. Some of them I might already have gotten the answers for. Um, the says coffer dams are not required for culvert replacement. Um, are you going to need to dewater in order to replace those culverts? And if so, won't those require coffer dams? Oh, my culvert designer isn't with me, but I believe the the intent right now was to to channel flows, at least with the twin pipes. It was the channel flow within a, a pipe and then stage it accordingly. Mm -hmm. For the the deeper pipe, uh, I'm not sure how exactly he was envisioning a dewatering. I think it may have been pumping or the, or, the, or the like. But I can certainly get information to you if if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, it would be useful to have a dewatering plan you know, with some details about how it's going to be laid out and, you know, where things like uh, having additional capacity available if we get, uh, you know, uh, some kind of a tropical storm come through or something like that. Um, you know, so just the details of how you're going to make sure that the dewatering is done in a way that keeps the clean water separate from dirty water and has the capacity to move the water if we get, you know, a significant storm. Um, yeah, so I'm just, for the record, I'm just going to say that in the field, we talked about, you know, the benefits of, uh, of, uh, corrugated metal pipe over a concrete pipe of the same size, and you're investigating options around that. Um, we have talked about embedment depth and its ability to be retained within a structure during storms and that the planned embedment depth could probably be deeper than what was proposed. Um, at some point in, in the narrative, it said that regrading of intermittent stream to allow for improved drainage and flow of the stream. Is that still proposed? And if so, where does that, where is that uh, proposed to be done? Honestly, I'd have to, I'd have to research that and get back to you. Okay, that's, uh, that's fine. Um, sorry. That one is... Yeah, it's the, um, I want to say it's here. Yeah, so it's at 40 plus 50. And it's sort of like, it's, you remember it comes in, let me see if I can find the plan sheet in the NOI. Let's see, 40 plus 50. Mm -hmm. Sorry, let me find out. Let me see if I can fly this over here. Oh, that worked. Okay, 40 plus 50 is gonna be maybe one more. Maybe two more. So this is um this area in here. Out of you can speak to this a little bit more. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, so that, we actually looked at this and, and walked by it. 
This is a highly unique and challenging situation for the project. There's actually three ditch lines in here that all converge in this location. Uh, the, inter the, the, the regrading of the stream, um, I, I can't point, but I'll say is for the stream that comes down the hill from the left mm -hmm. to the right before it, before it makes its way or, or is conveyed by the, the crossing culvert. That's a very narrow water course. It was dry when we were out there. I specifically looked at it just to make sure what we what we were proposing could happen. It's so close to the road. It's so high above the road. Something has to be done in order to put the road in. And so we're trying to have the absolute least footprint of impact we possibly can and trying to just essentially shift that stream over slightly to make sure it'll convey into the new culvert. Okay. So is that is that like uh, existing and future location been determined yet or is that is that on the plan? Yeah, I guess this this is it. What we show is existing. Uh, we don't show proposed. We don't show, as Todd said, we're going to take this stream as it comes down through here and just shift it out more so that it has. Um, I would say this is the stream. Uh, th those two, two those two lines that are, that the arrow is pointing to is the relocated okay. intermittent stream. Mm -hmm. Right through here. So, uh, I don't know. And the current location is even closer to the road? It's slightly closer to the road, and I believe it's at a different grade. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I guess a somewhat related question is uh, when I looked at the table of, of resource area impacts, it was surprising to see that you list impacts to the land underwater, but no impacts to banks. And intermittent stream is pretty much all bank. So I wondered if that was an oversight. I mean, you certainly just described what I would consider to be an impact to bank. It may not be a loss of bank. It may be uh, just a reconfiguration of it. I can go back and look at the report from the wetland scientists and reevaluate that. I know that for um, the streams that are stream crossings where we have um, mean high water, for example, uh, they had noted that these streams are small enough that there is no bank that you've got, or mean high water is basically the same as the bank line. So, um, but I think that this, this site was our place where we did have bank impacts. But I'll go back and double check on that one. Yeah, the, the bank extends from mean low water to mean high water or first break and slope. Intermittent, intermittent stream, everything is exposed at low water. So the stream channel itself is considered bank, and there really is no land underwater except for a hypothetical, infinitesimally narrow band that is only legally there to say that there are two banks to a stream and not one. Uh it, it's sort of a bizarre uh, court ruling or administrative law judge ruling or something like that. But um, yeah, so basically that would be for an intermittent stream, you would have virtually no impacts to land underwater and all the impacts would be to bank. Um, and then another question was, you know, uh, you talk about this being within the hundred year floodplain of that uh, in, in some areas, there are no uh, bordering land subject to flooding impacts shown in the table, I believe, is my memory. Is is it the case that there will be no uh, no discharge of material within that 100-year floodplain? Uh, because, you know, for any additional material, there has to be compensatory storm uh, uh, flood storage. Now, technically, the 
bordering land subject to flooding doesn't begin until the end of the BBWs. So if all of the impacts are in the BBW, ironically, that doesn't count as land subject to flooding because resource areas don't overlap except for riverfront area. So I, I consider that maybe that was the issue that, you know, that all of the areas of the 100 year floodplain were also wetland and therefore they did, even though it was a 100 year floodplain, it's not bordering land subject to flooding. Uh, but I thought I would ask the question. We can go back and double check that. I I know, in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, from the stormwater analysis that we don't have substantial enough fill in the floodplain to uh, require compensatory flood storage. But I can go back, I can double check on that. My understanding is that the floodplain is in the area adjacent to the mitigation site. That's one of the only floodplain areas. Uh, that's the stream that is subject to a floodplain. Mm -hmm. And so we were looking to remove materials adjacent to that area, not fill into that area. Based on so your based on your description though for the lack for the inability or, or overlap of of lines that the project wouldn't be credited for removal of any materials adjacent to that floodplain no it might it's one of those things where if there was fill in the 100 year floodplain at the same elevation and you were taking stuff out at that elevation even if it's to build a a a, a replacement wetland you have compensated for the flood storage that that was lost by the fill and, and in my understanding of the that performance standard is that anything other than a de minimis um, amount of fill in the floodplain has to be compensated for uh, and that you can't necessarily use, you know, would it raise the water elevation as the criteria for when it needs to be compensated for, or else fill in the in the Connecticut River floodplain would never be <laughs> need to be compensated for. So we have to think about cumulative impacts that, you know, if everybody were to fill an equal amount, would that cumulatively result in potential changes to flood profiles downstream? Um, but I don't know that that's even an issue in this case. I just raised the question. Yeah, so Kimberly, would you could you go to uh, the plan sheet where the mitigation site is? Sure. I would say also that other than the wetland areas that we've identified, there is very little um, fill in the floodplain at all. So but we would definitely double check on that. Right. Yeah, I'd say uh, the actual plan sheet. So this is the this is the the mitigation area blow up, but this is the area where the there was an identified floodplain, this culvert, and the one mm -hmm. that we looked at and we talked about for potential swapping of mitigation. And so this was uh, this was the area where there was floodplain. I was trying to get our plans to see that there was no there's no fill in that floodplain, but. I think I'm running out of questions. Um, commissioners, any questions occur to you as part of this discussion? None for me, thanks. No, I'm all set. <clears throat> And uh, Kimberly, or, sorry, no, George, no. George, you said no questions? No questions, no. Okay. And Kimberly and, and Todd, do you have any questions for the commission at this point? No, procedurally, what our next steps are, we'll wait to hear from you in regard to the potential to increase the stream crossings. Um, Having said that, if we do that, that would be that's going to require a little bit of time to re-engineer those crossings, mm -hmm. um, and then we'll need some time, obviously, to revise the plans to uh, with the suggestions that we've discussed tonight and um, pull things together. So, um, are you extending us to a date uncertain, or do you extend us to a certain date? 
My suggestion is that, I mean, we generally have to extend it to a date certain. And it's, a, you know, if you knew now that it would take you a couple of months, we might extend you to a, you know, to a, a date in November or December or whatever you needed to get ready. Another way and probably the most likely outcome, I would think, would extend you to our November or our October meeting, sorry, the October 16th meeting. And if it turns out that you're not ready to present any additional information, just give us permission to extend it further and we will just reopen the meeting and then immediately continue it to, to the November meeting. And, and, and then we won't discuss anything because we'll have nothing to discuss, but we will at least have, you know, announced when the next date certain will be when we will potentially consider the project further. Okay, that makes sense to us. Do we have to re-advertise or re-notice um, the continuation? No. Okay. Um, so uh, you give us permission to to continue the hearing to October 16th at 7 p.m.? Todd, do you, do you agree with that? Yes. Yes. Yes, I do. I, I just have one question. It's really what's really going to drive the schedule on this is this mitigation site and this the particulars for what would be needed as we spoke about in the past. You know, if we can prove hydraulic connectivity without without uh, twelve months of of groundwater elevations, um, that's almost a that's almost a requirement, you know, so we'd have to figure out how we can prove that. Um, I, I think, think if good... you get a good soil scientist to do, you know, some soil pits where, you know, they can demonstrate where the seasonal high water table is and where they permanent. High... I mean, I'm, I'm an amateur at this stuff, but generally the area where you have um, modeling or, uh, you know, redoxomorphic features that tends to give you where you have fluctuating water table. And then when you end up with glade soils, you're in an area where it's pretty much wet all the time. So if you can demarcate where those zones are and then indicate a depth to excavation, that's going to be conservative, meaning that it's going to be wet no matter what. And if anything, it'll be too wet rather than too dry. You know, that's one way of, of sort of proceeding without, you know, long-term hydrology records. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We have a wetland scientist on staff who can go out and take a look at that and dig those test pits. Um, she and I have both trained in wetland science, and uh, you're speaking my language. Okay. All right. Um, does anybody on this call or in this meeting have any comments or questions you'd like to offer at this time? I am. I'll just t chime in as representative Waitley in the highway department. Um, the thing about the 40 plus 87, um, that stream culvert crossing, um, perhaps when it comes to the actual construction, city could shut it off. Um, as we know, that stream that comes in, probably when you did your site visit, it's dry. That other one that Todd made mention to being very unique, how high it is coming in off of the, the bank towards the road. Um, that area gets all dry. So really in the summer months, the only water that's flowing there is what the city of Northampton is is allowing to flow out of their culvert, out of their water main. So they could probably reduce the volume to make the project go easier at that point. So that's the the twin twenty fours. Yeah, the twin twenty four. The 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 reason where that water comes from. That's that is their twenty inch water main that comes from the the lower reservoir, and the reason that it it was done that way back in 1900, 1901, was they put that pipe in cross country to the point where from that point on to the other reservoir, it will run by gravity. They didn't need it to be encapsulated in pipes anymore because as you go back towards the, the reservoir, there's high spots and there's low spots. So without it being encapsulated in a pipe, they'd never be able to get their water because that's just a gravity flow. So it's basically a siphon. The water is being siphoned from that outlet back to the lower reservoir 
and they and can control it and shut that they can slow it down so it comes to the surface for the last leg yeah of it. right if you were to right where that culvert is if you walk back to probably station oh say 44 roughly you'll see the end of of their 20 inch main where they have access and control on how much water comes out of it yeah so good suggestion that may uh, allow that one crossing to be replaced without any dewatering if you can do it during the dry months and uh, you have some control over what's coming out of those streams All right, well, if there are no other comments or questions, um, I guess the vote before the commission is to continue the public hearing until our October 16th meeting. Um, actually, may I suggest that we make it 715 and that way if we have any quick items that could be addressed, we can get those finished before we get into the more lengthy discussions of the, the NOI. I just say that because we have two applicants that are on the call right now that have very quick things, but I didn't know about them until I'd already set the, the time for this public hearing. So they're like getting an education, I guess, or else they're like watching cartoons on the computer while we're doing this. So, yeah. so um, commission all in favor of continuing the hearing until October 16th at 7.15 p.m.? Aye. 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 Hi. Okay. It's unanimous. Thank you very much, Kimberly and Todd. And feel free to contact me if you have questions. And I will get back to you um, when I've had a chance to talk to Heidi Davis and, and let you know what comes of that conversation. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right. Uh, JD, Alex. You want to thumb wrestle to see who goes first? You probably like stepped away from the computer and have no idea that we're calling on you, right? I'm here. <laughs> I'm here too. All right. I heard JD first. So JD, yep. uh, give us a, just a quick um, summary of your project and then we'll vote on it. The quick summary is that my clients, Stephen and Margaret Hart, um, wish to put a swimming pool and uh, already the lawn is actually established now a, a grass area in the backyard the pool is probably very close to the 100 foot foot setback um, which was defined by um, Ward Smith when he delineated it um, it's possible that the fence and perhaps a small concrete patio around it might extend into it but we're still very very close to the 100 and the 50 is um Silt fenced for erosion control. It's now a little bit stabilized with some grass growing and it's monumented. And this is a uh, two gray oak lane, correct? correct. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we did a site visit for this project the week before, what is September 9th or 10th? I can't remember. The, uh, the 10th. 10th. The 10th, yeah. Yeah. Um, any comments or questions from commissioners? No. No. No, nothing from me. All right. Well, I think then the vote before us is to issue a negative determination of applicability, I would suggest without conditions, unless somebody wants to propose any. Um, anybody want to propose a condition for this? No. No. All right. All in favor of issuing a negative determination of applicability without conditions? Say aye. 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 All right. There you go, JD. I'll try to get it in the mail as soon as I can. Uh, do you, you want me to send it to you or send it to the uh, landowners? Send it to me, please. I'll actually okay. pick it up at the town offices. That's easiest for me. Okay. Uh, should I, I, I can just leave it in the conservation commission's mailbox yeah. in an I'll envelope. Email and get it. Um, okay. we intend to leave the silt fence up till next year till this project is complete. It's not going to come down. Okay. Yep. No, sounds good. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'm going to stay on just listen to Alex's. All right. Thank you.
Hey, Alex, you're up next. Can you just give yep. us a brief summary of your project? I'm intending to build an agricultural barn on my in front of my house. It's within 112 feet of the wetland. Um, the barn's footprint is 36 by 40. Um, and there's a road separating the wetlands from my property. And your um, property is at 242 Haydenville Road, correct? That's that's correct. Great. Any questions or comments from the commission? No. Okay, and here again, I think the it may call for a negative determination of applicability without conditions, unless somebody would like to propose conditions. Any conditions being suggested? Nope. 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 Okay, all in favor of a negative determination? Aye. 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 Very good. All right, Alex, I'll get it out to you as soon as I can. Um, you can leave it in the Conservation Commission mailbox, and I'll have JD pick it up for me. <laughs> that keeps it easy for me. It, it also saves the cost of certified mail. So yep. thank you very much. Thank All you. Right, have a good evening. Sorry you had to wait so long for your turn. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Right. Good night. Hi, right. right, Keith. Is there more you want to discuss with us tonight? Just checking. You're welcome to sit and listen if you want to. He may have walked away not knowing he's still logged on. Mm -hmm. um, I think all that's left for us now is the minutes, approval of the minutes. So, um, well, I guess in maybe one update. So, uh, anybody have any comments or corrections for the minutes of our last meeting? Nope, looked fine to me. Didn't see any changes. All right. All in favor of accepting the minutes? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, the one update that I have is, is that uh, tomorrow we're going to interview three candidates for the shared conservation agent position. So we've we selected some finalists. We're going to see how they stack up. It's going to be back to back to back interviews tomorrow afternoon. And we'll keep our fingers crossed that we find somebody good. Oh, great. Anybody there have any updates or other business? important gossip that we should record and play for the rest of the town <laughs> nope all right well thank you for coming out tonight and if we make this adjournment quick enough well keep it to eight o'clock and you won't go over an hour so thanks uh, thank you so much we'll see you next month yeah thanks you, Scott. Okay. Mm -hmm. good night okay. good night